Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Manny Diaz Show, uh, another season of University of Miami football. Joe Zagacki alongside University of Miami head coach Manny Diaz and my broadcast partner Don Bailey Jr. as we get ready to kick off the 2020 college football season. The Hurricanes will begin on a Thursday night game against Alabama Birmingham at Hard Rock Stadium with an 8 o'clock kickoff, and Canes have been in training camp. Well, it seems like for a long time, Coach, but uh, things so far are going smooth. It's been a very... Interesting, I'm sure, off-season and very interesting training camp. How have you been able to navigate us to this point where we're just a couple of days away from kickoff? Can't believe we're actually here. Um, I mean, 2020 has all been about taking everything day by day. Um, our players have already overcome immense challenges just to get us to that to this point. You know, the fact that we actually have a game that we can talk about and, and prepare for because for a long time that was in doubt and we didn't know. And, and really it, it was up to – what their their behavior patterns were and and you know being a model for staying safe and staying healthy and and that's really gotten us to this point. Manny, what do you think was the point where the team just really bought in? You hear that in sports forever and ever, buy in, buy in. But I'm talking about the buy in to make sure that everybody's going to respect the new rules and to get this season to kick off. Well, it had to be immediate, you know, because when we you know we probably brought 65 or so players. Uh, for summer workouts starting around June 15th. And, you know, it could have it could have gone bad right away. So, we, you know, all of those testing, the, the testing rounds we put our guys through, we knew that they were all very important because our football team and a couple other sports were really the first student at, students that we brought back on, onto our campus here in Coral Gables. So they were, in essence, the test run for being able to bring the, the, the larger student body back, you know, in August. And and how they were able to function and how they were able to, you know, sort of keep the virus out of our building was the, sort of the big battle cry uh, we talked about. So, it, 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 you know, there was we couldn't have a gradual, you know, building. We had, to, we, had to, we had to be really good right from the start. Coach, why do you think it became important to the players? Because it can't happen. You had great leadership, of course, with you and President Frank and the administration. But ultimately, it has to be important to the players. Why did it become so important to the players? Well, they love playing football. You know, and and it's something that they've done since they were their little kids, and they've been good at it, and 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 it's just you know they love the being a part of a team. You know, with 2020, what what we all kind of got knocked sideways back when we went into lockdown is we really had no structure, right? Every day was Groundhog Day, and there was really no sense of community, and that's really been an issue of, of you know globally in this t calendar year is just you know we're so divided on so many issues and. And so the, the wanting to come together as a team, the wanting everyone to have a common purpose, to think of something bigger than yourself, um, you know, I think we really all appreciated that when we got back into the office in the summertime, got back into workouts, and, and ultimately got back into, into training camp. Coach, I really want to give you credit for asking your football team to be leaders on campus when about other students possibly not wearing a mask and how important it is, but setting an example, not on the field, we talk about that and we talk about the games, but when they go into the, the student body to set an example there as well, and they bought in on that fact as equal. Well, they did. You know, we always, any given year, you always tell, you know, the, the players that they have more to lose than sometimes than just the general student body or just people out in public, right? And that's whether that's behavior uh, how we operate there there are just things that if you want to be an elite football team there are decisions that you cannot make when you're outside this building 2020 presented a whole new level of decision making and 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 so the understanding that that our season was and still is dependent on the compliance of many people doing the right thing um, to keep the numbers down what we have seen is that the numbers are man they, they are they're malleable i mean we if, if, if there is a proper pattern of behavior, and we've seen it in Dade County where our pro positivity rate was in the 20s for the majority of the summer, and, and now it's, it's coming down, down, down into the sixes and sevens, uh, that is not just random. That is because of a pattern of behavior. So we wanted our guys to, to be leaders and show that it could be done. Uh, we kind of jump into some of the things you've been able to uh, accomplish in training camp, but I do think it was very interesting and uh, worth report, uh, repeating. You only had four practices in the spring, but one of the things you were able to show your players is by contact how much time players spend in contact, and so that probably getting the virus isn't going to happen on the football field because there isn't that long, sustained contact. Well, we, we at least wanted to give them what the data 
you know, suggested. And, and you know, obviously we don't want to we don't want to have anyone on our practice field that 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 is carrying the virus. And now with our testing, we hope that we have the ability to eliminate that or make it the, the odds very low. Um, but yes, I mean, I, we have tried to do this entire year is be as transparent as we possibly could with the players, because as we know, again, another aspect of 2020, there's so much information out there. Not all of it is at times accurate. Um, so just be an open book. Uh, let them know what what's real, you know. And, and one of the things is, is actually, as you mentioned, is how much close contact are you in with your teammates during any given practice or even in a game. And what the numbers showed is that it was not it was not large periods of time. Manny, you're a parent, have beautiful kids, but every kid on your football team has parents or guardians. How did you keep them informed as well? Because you didn't want the translation to go wrong from from the student athlete to the parent or vice versa. That's right. Well, we, we've had a series of Zoom meetings with the parents really throughout the entire pandemic, um, just trying to do the same thing. I mean, try to let them know exactly, as you mentioned, what uh, um, what messaging we were giving the players and um, allow them to ask questions, allow us, even if we didn't know the answer. You know, the answer a lot of times in 2020 was, I don't know. And we struggle with that, right? It's, it's, you know, You know, we always want things to be certain. And when you're dealing with things, and a lot of times – as tricky as a virus, I mean, there is going to be some uncertainty as, as we were learning more about it as a medical community. But um, I think that communication going back and forth and, and, and letting everyone know that, that again, we are led by a pandemic expert at the University of Miami and Dr. Julio Frank. This is not this was never a, a football decision made by football coaches or athletic department staff. And and everything here was about what would be the safest to operate. And, and, and I think sort of, you know, with Dr. Frank being our North Star, it, it became very easy for everyone to see that there was a pathway forward. Let's talk some football. You made some uh, some changes in the offseason, and we're very excited to see your offense. Brought in three new offensive coaches, all former offensive coordinators. Coach Lashley comes in, spread offense, got yourself a new quarterback, uh, got a new right tackle. You got a lot of enthusiasm on offense. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you've seen and why you like it so far. Well, yeah, I mean, it was obvious towards the end of last year that, that things weren't working the way that we needed them to work. And, um, and, and to your point, you know, when, when, you're, when you're trying to get this program where we want it to go, um, you got to address your issues. And obviously we had some issues. So, um, you know, giving us a, a different style of offense, you know, making some things a little bit easier on our players um, that they could execute, um, getting the ball into space and, and, and allowing ourselves to play fast, I think, Number one, that was very exciting for everybody in our program. As you mentioned, Rhett Lashley, Rob Likens, Garen Justice. It's not just even, you know, stylistically, you know, the, the style of offense they like. It's really who they are as individuals, uh, very confident people, um, uh, coaches that, that have great connections with their players, you know, and, and that was an issue I think we had a year ago. So you're just, you know, again, from my chair, you're just trying to solve all your problems. And you know that you never have all of your problems solved, Um but there's, but that you know, again, that's what 2020 has been about, right? You know, find an issue and try to fix it. So we've been trying to do that, and we felt like we did that. You know, bringing in Derek King, you know, Jared Williams, a, a, a transfer tackle. I mean, just just a lot of you know, and then and then the class of 2020. Some of those guys who really are, are, have had a really good training camp. So um, it's a new year. Every year in college football is a new year. We've seen that in a couple of years with some of the teams. That, uh, if you look at LSU a couple of years ago and where they were to where they ended up, and and that's not to say that. It's always that simple. It never is, um, but we did feel we do feel like we're in a better place offensively than where we finished a year ago. Coach, give us some insight on what attracted you to Coach Likens, a guy that played the position in the Southeastern Conference, and then of, co of course Coach Justice, who also was a second-team All-American and an offense that was a fast pace at, at West Virginia. But what what led you to those guys and hiring them to be a part of this staff? Well, there's some people in this profession that I have an awful lot of respect for, and you know, you everyone's heard the 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 air raid um, passing game that's been, you know, that's really, you know, been, you know, different coaches around that have had great, great success with it. And it's kind of spread out through college football. And I had some people that were very familiar with the air raid and have been in it for a long time that said Rob Likens was the best wide receiver coach in the country. And if you want to throw the ball um, and have a great level of success, you better have a wide receiver coach who's a great teacher. Um, so that was really exciting. But getting Rob in, you know, when you really get the people in your building, then you get to find out really how they connect with others. And I think that's where our receivers have really bought in to not just Rob's teaching, but who Rob is as a person. Garen Justice, I think, very similar. 
Uh, we saw the success he had a couple years ago when he was at FAU, great connections um, in South Florida in recruiting. Um, so very highly regarded, but but I feel the same way when they, when they, that you just, it's like recruiting. You just don't really know until you get them into your building. Um, you try to find out as much information as you can, but um, the way that, you know, again, the way that Garen carries himself, I think he gives all of our offensive linemen confidence, which is so important in that position um, and just has a demeanor about him that, that lets those guys know that, listen, if you do what I say, this stuff is going to work. I think uh, when I think about the spread uh, offense, I think about big plays uh, created by perimeter players. You've got a nice blend now, some older receivers, and you brought in a, a nice crop of young receivers as well to compete. Uh, what are your thoughts on where they are right now? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. I mean, you 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 want to get the ball, you want to attack the you know the grass, and 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 get the ball to your playmakers, and some simple ways to do that. So, the ability to have an older guy like Mark Mike Harley, a senior, you know. One of the hardest working guys on our team, uh, Mark Pope and D. Wiggins, kind of entering year three, which is really the year you like those. You know, they both flashed a year ago, and you like them to really have the ability to break out. Um, and then some young guys, as you mentioned, you know, Jeremiah Payton, and we really like all the, the the freshman wide receivers that we brought in. All those guys have made plays in training camp, so now they just have to learn, you know, how to bring it into a game, you know, which will be a process throughout the year. So, you know, having those weapons on the outside is something that Miami should have you know and and that's why again the piece of having the quarterback that can and and, and the system but then now the quarterback that can distribute the ball to the playmakers we have at um should should always be a key to our success coach i don't know that there's a defensive coordinator in the history of the game that would want to have an offense that doesn't run the football at least successfully and everything that i've seen at practice miami is running the football successfully it's there's talent but also let's not confuse it it's a big part of the game plan Oh yeah, well, I mean, again, that's always a misnomer of the of the spread offense is that you know that there's an unwilling to run the ball or be physical, and and really the opposite is true. I mean, obviously with 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 Red, his background with Gus Malzahn at Auburn, they're going to run the football and they're going to throw play action passes, um, and you'll see a lot of the same things with us, you know, and, and even Red knows, you know, you throw to score but you run to win, you know, and and that's really the fun part when you get the tempo rolling and you can just lean on people and and run that ball, and what you're really trying to do is you bring more and more people inside to stop the run. Well, now you're that's where the one on ones and all the the open field is on the outside. So, and then and then the, the added element of having a quarterback who is now a run threat that's a whole different dynamic for a defense as well. We'll continue with more of the Manny Diaz show. The breakdown segment is coming up next. It's now time for the breakdown segment with head coach Manny Diaz. Coach, what do you have for us today? Tackling. Always a big thing in openers. Um, so I wanted to sort of, you know, take a look inside the hood of, of, of our, our tackling progression, how we teach it, and show some clips of how it comes uh, together during the course of a game. So um, really, we, we coach two types of tackling. And this our system uh, was re really descended from Pete Carroll and the Seahawks. Uh, he was really the, the, the forerunner in, in, in introducing this to the football community probably about five, six years ago, when we all understood we had to coach tackling differently to take the head out of the game, to protect the players um, who we're playing with. So we've been in the system now tackling for, like I said, since about 2014. Um, in addition to really um, doing a great job of being a, a, a sure tackling team, it has really helped us being a safe tackling team. And, and that's why we use the shoulder to tackle. We don't use the head and really – it really descended from rugby tackling. So the first tackle we're going to talk about is the cane tackle. And a cane tackle is what we use when I can see the front of the person I'm going to tackle. So if I can see the front of the tackle, what I'm going to do is in a cane tackle, I'm going to take my nearest shoulder and I'm going to put it into your nearest thigh. So let's take a look at the video and see an example of a cane tackle. All right, so this is from a year ago. And you'll see number 55, Shaq Quarterman, Okay. So again, what a great tackler Shaq was. Okay, so let's take a look as, as the play unfolds and the situation Shaq finds himself in. Okay, Shaq right now is in a what we'd call a right shoulder cane tackle. He's in outstanding body position. He's got his knees bent, his head is up, his near toe and near knee are closest to the ball carrier. Okay, he's going to put his shoulder on the thighs of the player and then he's going to squeeze the player right below the hamstrings, right above the knee, and squeezes two of his knees together. If you think about it, it is really hard to run with your two knees squeezed together, okay? 
He will run his feet on contact, which you see right here. You see Shaq hit and see the second foot come right there and run his feet on contact. And when you're a guy like Shaq and you pack a punch, okay, even without the head being in the contact, you see and the perfect wrap and you see the player end up on his back and Shaq's still in a wrapped up position. So anytime I see a person from the front, if I grab him high, remember he's facing my goal line. If I grab him high, his feet are still moving. So anytime I see the front of a player, I've got to wrap up low, okay? Here's another example from a year ago. Okay, this is the ball's caught. And again, the key, you know, offenses are going to complete passes. you got to keep it from being an explosive play in the open field. And Gervin Hall, the same thing right here. Does a great job. This is a right shoulder, uh, left shoulder tackle, rather. Okay, the head is off to the side of the body. Okay, over here. He's going to wrap up the thighs of the player. And again, physical contact. Great job right there. Even without hitting him with the head. It's a little hard to tell from this angle. But the head is on the outside of the body over here. Wraps up the legs, and again, the player goes backwards. And see how Gervin on the finish is still wrapped up on the on the legs? And this is why we drill this every day in practice. We always, we don't like tackling dummies and sleds. We like tackling people. Because I want every player on defense to understand what it means when you take a, a, another person's legs and tie them together and what happens to that person when you do that. Okay? So that's a cane tackle. Now, the other type of tackle we talk about is a cane roll. So on a cane roll, what this means is that I have to, it's the same thing as a cane tackle. I see the front of the person I'm going to tackle. But now, as I've run my feet on contact, the player is not going to the ground. So this is Al Blades coming from outside in. Okay, so for Al, this is his right shoulder. So it should be a right shoulder cane tackle. So right before impact, again, Al has his nearest knee and nearest toe closest to the ball carry. And he is shooting his right shoulder into the near thigh board of the player he's going to tackle. And again, remember, the player is facing downfield, so that's what makes us a cane tackle. He's going to wrap up the legs, but what you see right now is that the player is still going forward. So what Al is going to do, and the way we, we coach this, Al is going to roll on his body. And if you roll on your back, when you grab a person's legs and then roll on your back, that person is going to go to the ground. So that's exactly what happens right here. Even though Al slips off the one leg, but he's got the other leg tied up, rolls on his back. When people get rolled on their back, their, their progress stops, okay? Here's another great example from a defensive lineman, okay? We always say that tackle for losses, anytime, and you know that's a huge part of our defense, almost all TFLs are cane tackles because when you pop in through a backfield, okay, which happens to us all the time, like Jordan Miller right here, runners are generally going to try to stop their feet to try to make you miss. And if you go high, if a defensive lineman lunges high, you're generally going to fall off the runner as the runner ducks down. So you can see right here, Jordan is a left shoulder cane tackle. Okay, he's getting his shirt pulled right there, but we should not pay attention to that. Okay. All right, so right now his nearest shoulder is his left shoulder. Okay. He's going to put the left shoulder on the thigh. But again, because he's in a, in a trailing position, he's not able to stop the man's progress. He's not able to put the thigh in a north-south position. So what he's going to do is he's going to wrap up the legs regardless, and he's going to roll on his back. So again, watch how he's got the guy, he rolls on his back. When you roll on your back, it doesn't matter how big and strong and powerful the other guy is. If you wrap someone's legs and roll on your back, that person's going to go to the ground. See how Jordan is still holding the leg even as the runner's going to the ground? That is our emphasis in tackling, is to wrap up on legs and run your feet, and the guy will go down. If he's not going down when you run your feet, roll on your back, and I assure you, you go down. And, and kids, you can try this at home with your little brothers or you know, and, and get your parents mad at you if you want to. Okay, here's another example. Bang. So this is, again, this is going to be Shaq Quarterman. He knocks the heck out of the uh, the fullback right here. Okay. Okay. It's a left shoulder tackle. But again, right now, we're not able to put, if I can't get the shoulder on the thigh board, which means this guy's feet are still trying to chop. See how the running back's feet are still running? Then he's going to roll on his back and see what Shaq does. Again, watch the wrap and watch the roll on the back right there. See how we still got the, the ball carrier wrapped up down there at the end? Still wrapped up. Still wrapped up. We want those guys to feel like it. That went, again, I've got you by the legs, and that's no fun. Now, a profile tackle, the profile is what you'd expect, okay? Profile means I see the side of the person that I'm going to tackle. So a profile tackle, okay, instead of going for the legs, now we're going to go for the, the, the near pectoral muscle. And the reason why we do that is because in a profile tackle, now I'm square, and the person I'm tackling is turned, which means I'm in the more powerful position. Okay, so again, here's Shaq right here. Left shoulder, profile tackle. He sees the side of the person he's going to tackle. He's going to put his shoulder pad through the near pec of the, of the ball carrier. And then same thing, but see, and it's a little bit tough to see, but see how Shaq's near knee 
is still forward. So if it's a left shoulder tackle, I got to bring my left toe and my left knee, which connected by the same leg. If I bring them to the ball carry, that will give me a put me in a powerful position, which you see right here, bang, and then either run your feet or, or again, roll on your back, and that guy's going to go right to the ground. Okay, another example right here. Most profile tackles are back in a hole, which means right in, in, in closed situations like this, normally tackles that take place out in space are going to be cane tackles. So again, sh so watch, Shaq Quarterman is square, the running back is turned. So when that's the situation, what Shaq's going to do is he's going to put his shoulder on the, the near pec. So right now, this is a right shoulder profile tackle is how we would say this. And then what you want to do, and see Shaq right here, take your right elbow and throw your right elbow up to the sky. Bang. And what the right elbow does, your hips follow your elbows and, and all, the, all of your powers out of the ground, your lower body is where your power is. So watch Shaq throw the right elbow, which brings that hips and, and squares his hips. And now he's got the guy wrapped up and it's a bad down for whoever that guy is and the rest of the team is coming to finish up on the tackle. So what makes this system very easy is that there's no, there's no gray area. You, see the, you either see the front of the guy, you see the side of the guy. So our players always know in every tackling opportunity they have, it is either a cane tackle or a profile tackle. And the, and the only thing that I care about of that is where is my, what shoulder do I have that's close to the ball carrier? And if I always hit with that closest shoulder, then my head is always out of the tackle. All right, well, thank you for joining us for the breakdown segment with head coach Manny Diaz. Well, it's been a long, hard, tough road to get this far, but we're going to have football, Miami and UAB at Hard Rock Scene. For Don Bailey Jr. and Manny Diaz, Joe Zagaki, thanks for joining us on the Manny Diaz Show.